Sergeant, it uh, looks like we have the live stream up. Mr. Chair, are you ready? Mr. Chairs. I am ready. Councilmember Ku, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sergeants, if you could start your recording. Sorry, uh, Sergeant Martinez. Let's just wait one more minute, please. Sorry. Okay. 10 4. Thank you. Okay, sergeants, we can begin when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Sergeants, uh, if you could please begin your recordings. Recording is up. Cloud has started. Backup is rolling. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Health, jointly with the Committee on Parks and Recreation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant Martinez, and welcome everyone. We appreciate your patience for a rare technical delay in the council's online hearing. We didn't have these things when we met in the council chamber. Uh, one more reason why I can't wait to see you all in person again soon. Uh, I'm really excited to be co-chairing this hearing with my colleague, Council Member Peter Ku, And I wanna acknowledge our colleagues who are joining us here. We have Council Member Borelli, uh, Council Member uh, Feliz, Council Member Diaz, Council Member Eugene, Council Member Ampri Samuel, Council Member Barron, Council Member Brannon, Council Member Gennaro, Council Member Van Bramer, Council Member Moya, Councilmember Jonai, Councilmember Riley, Councilmember Rivera, Councilmember Ayala, Councilmember Denowitz, and Councilmember Brooke Powers. Uh, committee Councilor, have I missed any of our colleagues? I think we've got all of you, but uh, if not, we'll come and we'll make sure to come back and acknowledge you shortly. Um, I'm going to read a, a somewhat truncated version of my opening statement so we can make up for a little bit of a lost time. Uh, I am thrilled that we are convening this hearing today, a joint hearing of the Committee of Health and the Parks Committee. And uh, our topic today is the future of Hearts Island, our public burial process, and the assistance that our city offers for people who cannot afford a burial on their own. And as you know, for over 150 years, the Department of Correction has maintained and operated New York City's public cemetery on Hart Island off the coast of City Island in the Bronx. The cemetery occupies 101 acres and is purportedly the largest taxpayer, taxpayer funded cemetery in the world. By many estimations, there are over 1 million people buried on Hart Island. Over the past decade, 1,000 to 1,200 decedents are buried on Hart Island per year, including adults children and fetuses. According to DLC records, in 2020, that number doubled. 2,210 adults and children received a public burial there. 875 adults 
were buried on Heart Island in April 2020 alone. We held a hearing on Heart Island in 2019, which I co-chaired, in which the council passed a package of legislation addressing issues like transferring jurisdiction of Heart Island from DLC to parks, examining transportation to and from Heart Island, development of an office of burial services, and mandating a hearing on public burial operations. The Human Resource Administration is in the process of determining July 1st, 2021, rapidly approaching. And we look more to hearing Look forward to hearing more about this transfer in today's hearing. We're also gonna focus on the process of financial assistance for those who can't afford a burial. And uh, there we have data, which is very disturbing. Of 3,589 applications received, only 357 were approved. Most of these applications were denied because of lack of documentation. And of course, we find this deeply disturbing and we wanna understand how we can reduce these barriers. Um, I think I'm going to skip to the end again because uh, we're almost, uh, we're so far behind on time. Uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, we've been joined also, um, no, we've got all the council members, that's good. So uh, finally, just let me just conclude by thanking um, our staff of the health committee who has worked very, very hard to prepare for today including councils Harbani Ahuja and Sara List, policy analyst M. Balkin, finance analyst Lauren Hunt, and data analysts Brooke Fry and Rachel Alexandrov, as well as Ben Witt for all their hard work in preparing for this hearing. And now I'm going to pass it off to our colleague, Chair Peter Koo. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levine. Good afternoon. I'm Peter Koo chair of the city council's committee on parks and recreation i'd like to welcome you to our virtual hearing that will examine the state of of the heart island transfer to the parks department uh, jurisdiction and updates to the public burial process i'd like to thank my colleague council member mark levine for holding this hearing jointly Heart Island has been a subject of quick concern to New Yorkers for many years. The island has had various uses over the, over the years, including the operation of several jails, a sanitarium, a Cold War missile wing, uh, base, and a rehab center for people addicted to narcotics. Currently, it is still used as the city's Porter's Field, which with over a million people have been buried there over the years. Since it has been used as a public burial location, numerous issues were raised that gave rise to a reform movement. The most problematic issue was that the island was under the control of Department of Corrections, DOC, which has expertise with inmate custody, not cemetery maintenance. This involvement justifiably involves security concerns that require family members visiting the graves of their loved ones to be accompanied by DOC staff. This negatively affected the visitation experience. That is why the council added in 2019 to pass numerous bills that seek to find a way to run this facility in a more humane way. One bill in particular, Local Law 2010 of 2019, will transfer jurisdiction of Heart Island from the Department of Corrections to the Past Department by July 1st this year. This puts in place an agency that has more expertise on managing land and public assets. It is my hope and the hope of so many who have advocated for reform to, to Heart Island that past the jurisdiction will, will result in making it easier and more welcoming for the list of kin and the public to visit Heart Island. 
However, PAS cannot do this alone. While PAS department has the expertise to help develop parts of the island into accessible open space, it does not have ex expertise in managing cemeteries or conducting burials. That is why you will take a citywide effort to transform Hart Island into a location that honors the dead and respects those who would like to visit their deceived loved ones. Numerous issues remain unsolved, including obtaining accessible data on the number and demographics of COVID victims who have been buried on the island, the status of the process for determining who should be conducting the burials in long term, determining what structures must be de demolished or otherwise made safe, and what the timeline is for increasing public accessibility and public amenities on the island. I look forward to examine ways by which these various agencies, including Parks Department, Transportation, OCME, uh, Department of Corrections, and HRA can all work together to plan and implement a long-term strategy to update Hart Island and improve the city's public burial process. Thank you very much and welcome. Back to you, Chair Levine. Uh, thank you. I think I pass it off to the committee council at this point for swearing in for affirmation for administration testimony. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is M. Balkin. My pronouns are they, them. And I'm the senior policy analyst to the Committee on Health for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. So please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted. So we thank you for your, in advance for your patience. And as a reminder, all hearing participants should submit their written testimony to testimony at council.myc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Patricia Lyons, Deputy Commissioner for Financial, Facilities, and Fleet Administration at the Department of Correction, Natasha Godby, the Deputy Commissioner of Emergency and Intervention Services at HRA, and Nicole uh, Dodger-Strom, Chief of Staff and Acting Emergency and Intervention Services Executive Director of Special Projects at HRA. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Sam Biederman, the Chief of Staff and Assistant Commissioner for Community Outreach and Partnership Development at NYC Parks. Uh, Dina Maniatis, the Executive Deputy Commissioner of OCME. And Dana Wax, the Deputy Chief of Staff at the Department of Correction. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. So please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Lyons. I do. Deputy Commissioner Godby. I do. Acting EIS Executive Director, Nicole Dogener-Strom. I do. Doniger. Oh, you. Doniger, I'm sorry, thank you. That's okay. Um, Assistant Commissioner Sam Biederman. I do. Executive Deputy Commissioner Dina Maniatis. I do. And the Deputy Chief of Staff, Dana Wax. I do. Thank you all. Um, Deputy Commissioner Lyons, you may begin when ready. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chair Levine, Chair Ku, and members of the Committee on Health and Committee on Parks and Recreation. I am Patricia Lyons, Deputy Commissioner for Financial Facilities and Fleet Administration at the Department of Correction. And I am joined this afternoon by Dana Wax, Deputy Chief of Staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today to discuss current Hard Island operations, the work the department has done to maintain operations over the cost of the pandemic, and our support in the transfer of the solemn responsibility of caring for those interred on Hard Island to the Department of Parks and Recreation and operations around city burials to the Department of Social Services. As per the city charter, the Department of Correction has historically been responsible for the management of Hart Island, the city's potter's field until the passage of Local Law 210, which transfers the management of Hart Island to our agency partners. In that time, we have worked faithfully to bury those interred on Hart Island with dignity and have provided opportunities for the public to visit their loved one's final resting place. The Department of Correction also works with families and the Office of the Medical Examiner to provide disinterment as requested. The Department of Correction also maintains a public database with the names of those interred on Hart Island to support family members searching for their loved one's final resting place. In April of last year, the city contracted with a vendor to provide burial services on the island allowing the department to transition away from having people in custody perform burials. By the end of 2020, we signed to hiring laborers specifically for this service. To be very clear, people in custody are not performing burials and have not performed them in over a year. All staff performing burials are provided with appropriate PPE, including N95s, masks, boots, and Tyvek suits. Although this has been a challenging year, I'm proud to say that all burial operations have run smoothly and without interruption over the past year. In light of the pandemic, visitation to Hart Island has been suspended since last spring. To support families of those buried on Hart Island during these difficult and physically distanced times, the department's executive chaplain began presiding over all burials in May, 2020. He has attended each burial since that time and also offers prayers and support to the staff performing this difficult work. Every Friday, he hosts an interfaith web service with religious leaders across the city. So all religions, all languages are represented in honoring those laid to rest on Hart Island. I am proud to share with the council today that we will reinstate limited monthly visits to Hart Island beginning May 15th. The department agrees that the process of city burials and the maintenance of Hart Island are better suited for agencies whose mission more closely aligns with this work. For the past year, we have met regularly with the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Social Services to share everything from blueprints of the island to our learned best practices. We will continue to be good partners throughout this transition and will continue to share our institutional knowledge with our sister agencies. I will now turn to Deputy Commissioner Natasha Gopi at the Department of Social Services to speak to their work as operations are transitioned. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the City Council's Parks and Recreation Committee, the Health Committee and their chairs for giving us the opportunity to testify. Today, we are here to speak about the Human Resource Administrations and our work on burial assistance for New Yorkers in need and Hart Island operations. My name is Natasha Godby, Deputy Commissioner, Emergency and Intervention Services. I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Doniger-Strom, HRA Chief of Staff and Acting Emergency and Intervention Services, Executive Director of Special Projects. The New York City Department of Social Services Human Resources Administration is the, is the nation's largest social services agency. Each year, we assist more than 3 million New Yorkers through the administration of 12 public assistance programs, including burial assistance. Every day in all five boroughs, HRA provides essential programs and supports to low-income New Yorkers. In administering these programs, HRA is at the forefront of this administration's efforts to combat 
poverty and address homelessness. Today, we are here to update the committees on HRA's burial assistance programs and their impact on New Yorkers in need during these challenging times. Pursuant to the New York State Social Services Law and Regulations and City Implementation Rules, HRA provides financial assistance to individuals to help meet funeral expenses. These funds are made available when a resident of New York City passes away, who was either receiving or eligible to receive cash assistance or supplemental security income, SSI, and leaves no funds to cover their burial expenses and there are no legally responsible relatives to able to pay such expenses. This assistance is critical to many New Yorkers who lack adequate funds to support their loved ones and ensures a burial or a cremation. Accessibility to these programs is important, which is why we have worked to reform the burial assistance program to ease the administrative and financial burden of grieving families at a time when they are coping with the loss of their loved one. The crux of the burial assistance program is to ensure vulnerable New Yorkers have access to financial assistance. These reforms put us in good stead as our city began to face the impacts of the current public health emergency. Burial assistance during COVID-19. Through the COVID-19 crisis, our agency has reviewed ex existing policies across the board to see where we can adapt most effectively and do more for New Yorkers in need. Over the past year, we have implemented sweeping reforms at a scale and speed never before seen to ensure the New Yorkers who count on us remain connected to essential benefits and don't have to worry about losing services, which is more important than ever. For example, as part of our top to bottom overhaul to make services and supports easier to access, uh, last spring and summer, we reviewed our burial services policies with a focus on how this program could go even further to support vulnerable New Yorkers. After a review of existing policies and despite the fact that the state has not increased the grant level for the state set public burial allowance in years, we took immediate steps within our city's power to make this vital resource available to more New Yorkers, including nearly doubling the value of this grant, ultimately providing more help to families when they need it most. As this emergency continues, we are committed to continuing to do everything we can to adapt our policies to meet this moment. To that end, even in the absence of a state grant increase, we're making the reforms implemented last year permanent so that the New Yorkers we serve can continue to access this increased amount of local burial assistance. Prior to the policy shifts we implemented last year, the funeral allowance was $900, which is the amount set by state law towards which the state will provide reimbursement. As noted, in the response to the pandemic in spring and summer 2020, we took immediate steps within our city's power to temporarily increase the value of this allowance from $900 to $1,700 with the increase funded by the city. This action nearly doubled this public assistance grant, making this vital resource go further for more New Yorkers in need during this, um, these unprecedented times. Moreover, we put in place several reforms, such as extending the application period to 120 days from the date of death and allowed applications to be submitted by email and other remote means in addition to in-person. Under state regulation, local social services districts can only provide this burial allowance grant if the total cost of the funeral or burial is less than an overall local district cost cap. The city's cap for many years was $1,700. And we, as we increase the monetary value of assistance we are providing to New Yorkers through the burial grant from $900 to $1,700, we also increased the required cap from $1,700 to $3,400. This increased cap is now permanent, is now a permanent feature of the program. 
These reforms mean that HRA is able to provide up to $1,700 in funeral allowance for funerals and burials, nearly twice the previous amount where the related costs do not exceed $3,400 or twice the previous cap, excluding certain expenses. This funeral allowance can be used for services such as funeral arrangements, burials, cremations, and services, and is responsive to New Yorkers' range of unique needs. We are proud to announce that these reforms are all either already uh, permanent or soon will be. We have published a proposed rule that would extend the $1,700 grant indefinitely, making it a permanent feature of HRA's burial allowance program even as we continue to advocate for an increase in the inadequate state grant reimbursement level. Now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Doniger-Strom, who can provide updates on Heart Island. Thank you, Natasha. I'd also like to thank the council for your work and advocacy on behalf of New Yorkers in need. As we work to rebuild our city with a focus on equity and ensuring New Yorkers can access quality services, we must also bring this spirit of reform to end of life planning. We remain committed to ensuring New Yorkers are provided with an appropriate and dignified location to be laid to rest, regardless of background. To that end, HRA is procuring a vendor to continue operate, operating Heart Island as the city's public burial grounds in the next fiscal year, as well as a vendor to evaluate the ongoing capacity for burials on the island. For decades, Heart Island has served as a public cemetery for burials of indigent individuals or for those decedents whose remains were either unidentified or unclaimed by next of kin. In the fall of 2019, Mayor de Blasio signed local legislation transferring control of Heart Island from the Department of Correction to the Department to the Parks Department, with HRA formally assuming oversight of the burial operation on the island on Heart Island. As part of this transformation, HRA solicited feedback via public hearing and issued an RFI seeking information about alternative public burial practices, including other possible locations for burial public ground in New York City. We did not receive any responses outlining a suitable location for alternative public grounds. Both written and oral responses were overwhelmingly in favor of continuing to bury decedents on Heart Island. As a result, HRA has issued a procurement to evaluate the ongoing capacity for continued burials on Heart Island, including assessing a range of potential best and alternative uses, and has issued an RFP to identify a vendor that can manage the day-to-day -day operations on the island as the city's public burial grounds in the next fiscal year. Due to the competitive bidding process, we cannot discuss the request for proposals beyond what is in the solicitation. The work behind bringing about change and operationalizing important reforms can be challenging, as is the case in Heart Island. However, we remain committed to the transfer of the island as we continue to provide dignified burial options to those in need. And we look forward to working with the council as we continue to make progress. We wanna thank the council for your partnership as we continue to work towards an equitable recovery for our city. We look forward to answering questions you may have. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Um, I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Levine, followed by Chair Ku. So panelists if you uh, from the administration, mm -hmm. if you can stay unmuted, uh, that would be great um, during this question and answer period. Thanks again. And uh, Chair Levine, you can go ahead and start asking questions. Thank you so much, Em. And I want to acknowledge we've been joined by our colleagues, Council Member Ulrich and Council Member Holden, and uh, appreciate the testimony of the administration. And I just want to state my view of the big picture here, which is that for too long, Heart Island has been treated as uh, a topic of shame in this city. And it's largely been kept out of the public consciousness of New Yorkers, uh, despite the fact that it is the final resting place for 1 million souls, veterans of every war going back to the Civil War, veterans of every, um, uh, major public health crisis, uh, up to and including uh, COVID, but of course, along the way, um, most notably HIV AIDS. And today it still remains a place which is uh, inaccessible to the public, 
difficult to access, not impossible, but difficult to access even for those who have loved ones there. Uh, and it's, it's in many ways an unsafe place uh, with uh, risk of flooding, with uh, uh, historic structures that are falling down. And uh, it could and should be so much more. It should be a dignified place, open to the public, not just to loved one, people who have loved ones buried there. A place which uplifts and celebrates the history, um, offers reverence to the stories of those who are buried there, including um, victims of the most recent pandemic. And our work over the last few years has been to move closer to this vision of a dignified final resting place for New Yorkers. And I would go so far to say that I would like to see this be a place that is not only the option of those with no other place to turn, but the kind of place that some New Yorkers feel like would be a good final resting place. And uh, we're very, very far from that goal, but I think partly just changing how we talk about it um, and being more public about it can begin to change the perception of Heart Island. Uh, for any of us who have visited, it, it is a place of stunning beauty in the middle of the Long Island Sound. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a remarkable place, unique in New York City, in some ways unique in the world. And I wish more New Yorkers knew of, knew of it and were able to experience it firsthand. So our work today continues on that uh, trajectory. And I have questions related to the big picture. I just have a couple of questions related to um, more immediate concerns about um, the use of Heart Island during our pandemic year and the extent to which it was required because of the horrible and painful number of New Yorkers we lost and the strain that put on the normal burial system. Uh, and, um, and this is actually a continuing story as I understand it. So uh, first, this may be a question uh, for you, um, Deputy Commissioner Maniotis. Uh, an estimate on the number of additional burials that have taken place since the start of the pandemic, beginning in March of, of 2020. I understand that in some cases, uh, it might not be clear whether that additional number of burials was directly attributed to the pandemic, particularly because in the early days, uh, sometimes people weren't diagnosed at time of death and that created other challenges. But uh, I think merely understanding how much above average over, I guess what at this point is a 13 or 14 month period gives us a sense of, of um, how many people either directly or indirectly due to the pandemic are buried there. Do you have a sense of that number, uh, Commissioner Maniotis? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Levine, uh, and for the question. Uh, I can tell you that in uh, the year, uh, calendar year 2020, we um, laid to rest 2,666 souls. And in uh, 2021, since January, that number is 504. So in both, case, in both cases, that is, that is far above the normal pace, correct? Uh, and if, if I'm just ballparking it here, would that be... Would that represent in, in totality over the period of the pandemic, both from calendar year 2020 and 2021, maybe 1,800 uh, burials above normal? Um, Is it possible to estimate that? So our usual uh, number for each year is approximately uh, 1,200. Uh, in 2019, we had a little bit less. It was 1,135. So, um, and that's the usual number uh, annually. So this year, the, we had in 2020, we had um, 1,531 more. And in 2021, we're not yet at that point where we can estimate uh, what that uh, excess Understood, but it sure does seem like even, even for 2021, the pace is at least a little bit above normal, correct? Uh, absolutely, yes, yes, that's correct. And, th and then there's the matter of the, the significant number of, of decedents that OCME is still storing in some of its, um, some of the special facilities that you created uh, in response to the crisis. Uh, and, and I'll say that the, the creation and rapid development of those facilities was itself an enormous achievement. And I know 
um, the kind of work it took for your team to make it possible to uh, indefinitely store folks who couldn't be um, handled by the normal private burial system. Uh, but the fact is at a certain point, uh, I presume that's not indefinite. And at a certain point, those decedents would be transferred to Hart Island. And could you tell us how many you're still storing and the timeline, if you believe that they will need to be transferred to Hart? Yes, so currently we have approximately uh, 750 uh, decedents stored at our um, long-term storage facility. And, um, you know, this is a temporary facility and it was uh, provided, uh, established, like you said, specifically to give families that additional time during a very stressed uh, period in, for the funeral industry, give them additional time to make uh, arrangements. Um, we uh, have and we will continue to reduce the size of the long-term uh, mortuary operation to meet the need as appropriate. So that number is uh, getting smaller and uh, it will continue to get smaller. And at what point, if at any point, will you begin transferring some of the decedents to Hart Island? Um, we will begin as soon as, um, uh, I, it's coming very shortly. So in the near future, we will begin to notify all the families that we've been working with that we are now going to ramp our operations down slowly, uh, give them the time, some, the time that they need and we'll keep the operation going as they need it. But we are uh, beginning to ramp those operations down and make the transfer to Hart Island. Okay, I, I think you know, clear communication to the public on that will be really important. Um, personally, as I mentioned, I don't think uh, that it, it should necessarily be treated as such a, a, a shameful matter for someone to be buried on Heart Island. Although uh, we understand that um, there are religious uh, traditions for whom uh, Heart Island is not ex an acceptable final re resting place and other um, perfectly understandable reasons why a family would choose uh, and prefer to be buried for a loved one to be buried elsewhere. So I'm, I'm assuming you've done everything possible to connect to um, the families of those who you currently have in, in temporary storage uh, and offer them resources if they choose another burial option. Chair, um, we, the OCME, and you know us well, the OCME holds families central to its mission. Uh, and as Dr. Sampson has said, the chief medical examiner has said over and over again, we uh, take care of the dead to help the living. Uh, and this is what we continue to do. Um, and yes, we have been working very closely with families and we'll continue to work with them. They're central to what we do. They're, they're all about what we do. Uh, and we have been referring as appropriately when resources are needed to uh, HRA, of course, and other nonprofit organizations. And would you say that most of those still uh, in, in your custody are people who are, for whom there's no family member who's actively engaged? Or is it the fact, is it the case that there are family members who are engaged and just don't have the resources or are choosing for whatever reason not to pursue private burial? I, my, my understanding and my opinion in, in this, I'd have to go back and check all the cases, but my opinion is that in fact, um, these most of the decedents that we're caring for right now it, are decedents who uh, their families have either decided that they want them to stay with, uh, to, to go to the final resting place at Heart Island, or the families that have uh, no longer are engaging with us regarding the decedent. Okay, th th thank you so much. Uh, I, I don't want to go on too long, but I, I just want to quickly talk about the future of the island. And, and that, uh, Sam, that may be a question for you since Parks is taking over in a couple of months. And, uh, um, and I see Matt Drury is on here as well. So I'm, I'm actually not sure. We have, we have multiple great, great leaders from the Parks Department here. So uh, um, could, could the Parks Department share any vision for us for... Um, any, the future of this island, landscaping, storm resiliency, um, management of structures which are, are falling down, like literally bricks are falling off. Uh, 
uh, a vision for the cemetery, which might be in line with the green cemetery movement. Um, could you share what share with us that that vision and those plans? So yes, of course. Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Levine, and uh, thank you for the recognition for me and the excellent mentory. Um, so, uh, any future planning efforts for the island um, have first to have to be informed by the HRA burial capacity study, uh, so that the city will revisit the discussion of long-term plans for capital improvements and visitation to the island after this study concludes. Uh, in any case, the island will first primarily remain a functional municipal cemetery, which as you noted is you know, a sacred site for many, many people, many New Yorkers. So any future decisions uh, have got to be respectful of the island's identity as a final resting place for thousands of souls. Um, now, vis-a-vis -vis the structures on the island, which you asked after and um, what's gonna happen with them, I'm happy to share that the mayor's fiscal 22 executive budget includes uh, more than $50 million in capital funds for the demolition of dangerous structures uh, and other work to help ensure that uh, workers and visitors will be safe as uh, we make changes to this island. And saying that 50 million is just for Hart Island? Yes, yes. For demolition and, and shoring up structures? And shoring up structures and creating space for future burials. Uh, that, that, I, I hadn't heard that news, that's, that's welcome. That's welcome news. Sorry, but if you had more points to, uh, on, on no, the picture. The um, main points there. That's great. Look, uh, the, the, the structures are in bad shape. They're probably all gonna have to be de demolished. If, if there were a way to preserve one, the, the, the one that's least decayed uh, as, as a way to preserve history and to create a place that could function um, for use of people visiting, whether it was uh, restrooms, uh, a learning center, uh, connected to some sort, some form of memorial to tell the story of the people buried there. Uh, uh, do, do you believe it might be possible to preserve any of the historic structures? I, it's a point well taken, uh, Councilman. I, uh, you know, just in my um, particular role, I couldn't, um, uh, I, we could get back to you. I couldn't weigh in on exactly what the state of each structure is or whether um, any particular one could be preserved, but it is, it is a point well taken and we're happy to circle back. And, and wh where are we on the FEMA work to prevent uh, future flooding? Uh, Matt, can I defer to you on that? Or... <laughs> DOC, I think our partners at, okay, that's sorry. frozen. I think our partners at DOC cannot speak to the FEMA yeah. work. Thank you. So the um, the FEMA funded shoreline restoration project concluded in December 2020. And uh, how confident are we now that that the island's not vulnerable to flooding? The project was designed uh, following the FEMA glide guidelines for flooding. So we're we're confident at this time that it will be it will be sustainable. You know, in the event of future um, man weather so events. It's only been, uh, so I say that was December, 2020, yes. that it was completed. So it's only been uh, four or five months, but have there been any instances of, of disinterment? And um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a very horrifying thought, but we've had cases of human remains washing up on, on City Island and other nearby coastline. Has that happened to your knowledge since that work was completed? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, that, that's good news. So I'm gonna pause there. I, I will come back for a round two question uh, to, to HRA on, on how we support uh, people who need financial assistance for burial. But uh, I don't know if I'm passing it back to you, Em, or, or straight to Chair Ku. But thank, thank you to the administration for uh, this discussion so far. Thank you, Chair Levine. Um, Chair Ku, if you'd like to ask your questions now, you can go ahead. And also, I'm um, sorry, Chair Ku, just uh, before we continue, a friendly reminder for other council members, if you would like to ask questions after uh, Chair Ku is finished, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order in which you raise your hand. Thank you, Chair Ku. You can go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all the representatives from different departments um, who come to testify today. So my questions is, uh, uh, the first question is related to the parks transfer process. You know, the park department will take jurisdiction over Hart Island on July 1st of this year. 
So can you tell us what is the uh, department's immediate plan for the island appoint taking jurisdiction? Uh, has uh, the department, yeah, can, can you, yeah, can you give, inform us about what to do upon taking over the, the island? Yes, Jaku, thank you. So as you note, um, uh, the jurisdiction uh, in accordance with local law uh, 210, formal jurisdiction of Hart Island will be transferred to uh, Department of Parks and Recreation on July the 1st, uh, 2021. So given that the HRA selection for burial operations is still underway, it is unlikely that parks will have an active management role on the island at the time of this formal, formal jurisdiction uh, transfer. Depending on the outcome of the selection process for burial operations, parks may take on uh, responsibility for various duties, including landscape management on portions of the island or operation of visitation and tours of the island. Uh, we are, of course, in discussion with the mayor's office and OMB regarding uh, different potential outcomes regarding our active role in the island. So has the department or any other agency study the facilities on the island in order to determine what structures must be dem demolished or otherwise may save? Or uh, should uh, greater public access uh, occur at some time? So um, as I noted that uh, there was that piece of really good news that um, the mayor's executive budget included uh, you know, 50 million or over $50 million in capital funds for demolition of dangerous structures and uh, to um, shore up safety concerns, as well as creating uh, additional space for future burials. Um, uh, but any future planning efforts um, really do need to be informed by that burial capacity study uh, being led by HRA. Um, so the city will revisit the discussion of long-term plans for capital improvements and visitation to the island after this study concludes. Uh, in any case, I do want to note that the island will primarily remain a functional municipal cemetery, as uh, Chair Levine noted. So any future decisions, decisions have got to be respectful of the island's <coughs> as the final resting place for thousands of New Yorkers. So does the department uh, know what certain uh, capital projects to, to move forward? So um, we are going to pursue. Uh, we're going to pursue a study of that uh, of what capital work needs to be done on the island following um, this HRA burial capacity study. So, what's the potential cost? Did you, you have an estimate? So, you know, as I noted, we do have uh, about $52 million in the uh, current exact or the future exact budget um, for demolition of dangerous structures, but, uh, you know, which is great. And I, I think it's that's the immediate need here in terms of what our vision for the capital needs of the island are. Um, anything beyond that, uh, you know, we, we would have to conduct a study first, which would come after the HRA burial study. So does the $50 million uh, covers uh, uh, the public transportation costs? for visitors to go to the island? So the $50 million is, or the $52 million is uh, um, uh, it devoted to, it's capital funds, right? So it's devoted to just demolition of dangerous structures and uh, safety concerns. So it's focused on that, on dealing with the state of the island itself as it is, um, rather than transportation concerns. Mm. So has, your department work with the transportation department uh, to develop plans that will be able to facilitate the visitation, uh, visitation of more members of the public or the relatives uh, of the disease you know, um, on the future. Have you worked with the transportation so it is, it will be an intra-agency process. So as details um, regarding the operation of Part Island are finalized, as you know, we lead up to this transfer and beyond it, um, in relation to the HRA selection process for a burial operations proposal, uh, city agencies, including ours and many others, um, will coordinate on the best approach for developing a Hart Island transportation plan in accordance with um, local law 211. Okay. 
That's that the department have a physical presence on the island. The the corrections they have a presence. Do you guys have a physical presence there now? Uh, so we don't have a physical presence there now, but um, leading up to, you know, we're, of course, have been in conversation with our sister agencies who have been wonderful, the, the agencies represented on this, um, on this call, on this uh, council hearing, um, uh, they who have been, you know, wonderful um, in sort of determining a path forward for, you know, what the park's presence on the island is going to be. But, you know, again, I have to note again that it is largely dependent on the outcome of the city selection process to uh, for a vendor to manage public burials. So uh, you mentioned the parks will take over formal jurisdiction on July 1st, right? Mm -hmm. But practically not until HRA uh, selects a vendor. So who will be in charge or responsible for any issues on the island? So um, as, it, as it is currently operating in the meantime between um, the HRA now and the HRA selection, DOC will um, retain this you know, solemn responsibility of overseeing burial activity on the island um, as they've done for decades. Okay, so my next day, the questions will be related to RFP and RFI. No? So maybe the, uh, the, the other representative answer me. HRA has been overseeing an RFI and RFP process to determine the future of Hot Island. Uh, and, and, and RFP was released on January 7th seeking requests for vendor to perform the burials on the island as well as other tasks. The RFP closed on February 16. So what actions have been taken since the RFP was closed? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Ku. The RFP actually ended up closing on March 5th. Um, and I, I make note of that because we did have several, we had a bidders conference um, which is part of the process with a new procurement. And um, several of the proposers had um, important questions that needed um, to be clarified from the RFP. Um, and we wanted to give the proposers enough time to respond to them adequately. So um, the RFP closed on March 5th. We launched the review committee, which is actively in process of reviewing all of the proposed responses. And we hope to have um, we hope to have an, an awardee soon. Um, in the interim, while the proposal was open um, and leading up to it over the last year, we've been meeting very often with our sister agencies um, to make sure that the transition can continue to move forward so that once a vendor is selected, um, we're ready to uh, step forward. So how many responses is, uh, uh, you, you receive for the RFP? Yeah, unfortunately due to procurement rules, I'm not allowed to, I'm not privy to that information nor am I, would I be allowed to share it. Okay. So given that the transfer of the island will occur in less than two months, when can, you ex when can we expect more information about the future of the island and the city's public burial process, right, such as how the burial process will occur and if you will be, be changed at all. We are also curious about the security, the maintenance and the visitation policies for the island. Yes, um, so, so all of those concerns are part of the RFP process and we hope um, that respondents, our hope is that respondents to the proposal um, uh, address address all those. They, in the RFP, we asked several questions. We asked about um, how a potential vendor would look at a pre-burial process, how they would um, do interments, would they continue the practices of DSC, do they have an alternate um, means of, of wanting to do interments, how they would manage exhumations, what they would do in case of another emergency like the one we just went through. Um, we also asked the proposers to look at, uh, outline 
how they would manage landscaping and burial ground maintenance, as well as security on the island um, and overall cemetery administrative function. So I think quite a bit of information will come out once these proposals are reviewed. Um, we um, are confident that we'll be able to find a good vendor. And in the interim, DOC, um, you know, as DOC stated in their testimony, um, uh, are no longer using incarcerated individuals to do the burial process, but have hired civil service staff um, who are doing an excellent job in maintaining the island. So I feel very confident in saying that there'll be no gap in services, what, both from maintaining the island and as well as um, continuing burial operations until we can make sure that we have a good and appropriate vendor in place. So how will you do with the security? Uh, does uh, we're going to use NYPD for the security on the island? That that's still to be to be determined. Um, it really is dependent on how the uh, proposal the the awardee proposes to manage security. I think security needs will change um, and have changed since um, no longer using incarcerated individuals on island. Um, but that's to say that we will be in conversations with NYB, NYPD to make sure that whatever the proposer um, or the awardee puts forward is an adequate amount of security for the island. So can you tell us something about the, the future visitation policy of the island? The, the future and the transportation policy is quite dependent on what both comes out of the uh, operations RFP and also the capacity study um, solicitation that we're engaging on as well. Um, I think, um, we, I mean, we are in constant conversation with DOT and their transportation plan. Um, they are continuing to work on it. Uh, it's still yet to be determined if the vendor will be responsible for visitation or if parks department will be, and that will be that will come out of um, when we award um, a vendor. I heard, I heard on, on, on um, administration will start uh, resume uh, visitation on May 15th to the island. So can you give us some details on that? Sure, I'll, I'll actually let my partners at DOC respond to what the visitation will look like starting uh, in mid-May. Sure, thank you. So um, we will resume visitation on a limited basis starting uh, May 15th. It will consist of two trips, one at 9 a.m. and one at 12 p.m. And um, to facilitate social distancing and appropriate um, COVID-19 measures, we're going to have um, 10 visitors per trip so they can be safely um, distanced on the bus that travels over to the island. So the in, in um, normal circumstances, you can be on the ferry boat, either in the cabin or on the deck, but to support social distancing in, in case of inclement weather, we're going to have um, the visitors on the bus, on the boat going over and, and returning to um, back to the Bronx. Uh, where, do, where do visitors take the boat though? Where, where do they? They, 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 they I'm sorry. Where, where did they take the boat? Uh, 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 you said the bus? Yeah, so they will board at the at the dock, um, the DOT dock. They will board a bus. Where, where is this dock? DOT dock where? Queens or uh, what? City Island. City Island, okay. Hmm. Um, they will board a bus that's on that dock. That, that bus will board onto the ferry boat that carries them over to Hart Island. Then they will... Um, proceed um, to the respective burial locations that are for their intended visit. Then they will reboard the bus, which will then get back onto the ferry boat and travel back to the city island dock that's operated by DOT for a return back. Uh, how, how, do, how do the visitors make reservations? How, on, on, how, they, how they call you in reservations? That we'll still be doing that online through our Office of Constituent Services. So council member, that actually will uh, remain unchanged from the way that the department, um, the way that, that visitors and the department operated prior to the pandemic. All visitors um, 
on our website have the opportunity to, I believe there's a web form and also a phone number and sure. an email address. Sure. Um, so there are many opportunities for a visitor to have to get into contact with the department and let us know that they'd like to reserve a spot to come uh, to Hart Island that day. Okay, I have just one more question. Um, the question is about future capacity of the island. Uh, there's a separate RFP on the capacity of the island for future burials. What part of the process is HRA in for this RFP? Uh, how many responses you get? So we are in the, thank you for the question. Um, we're really, we are actually quite excited about the capacity study. Um, we are in the final stages of awarding uh, the capacity study. We have an interagency steering committee that has members of, forgive me if I don't get everyone, DOC, DOT, Parks Department, DDC, DOB, HRA. I think that's everyone. I might be missing. Oh, OCME, uh, of course. Um, so it's a great agency group that, to make sure that all aspects of the city's interests are addressed by the vendor. Um, we hope that the vendor will begin their work um, over the summer. Um, and that will entail um, looking at the whole entire island, understanding which parts uh, we could increase burials on, which parts have been under underutilized. Um, now that the shoreline is restored, how close to the shore we can go. Um, since we've already made uh, major steps in taking down some of the unsafe, or plans to remove some of the unsafe buildings, they'll be looking at what's the possibility underneath the buildings. Um, they're gonna look at environmental studies uh, to see what the environmental impact is. Um, they are also going to be offering at the, so at the end of the study, which will take approximately a year, um, they will offer us a report that talks through um, things like where a visitor center could be, what, um, what could be there, um, possible storage on the island to help relieve some of the um, um, burden of OCME um, should another emergency um, happen. Um, so it's a, it's a very, there's archaeologists, there's architects as part of the capacity study. It's pretty robust um, and I think uh, will be a very critical tool um, and we're excited about it. So how, how long, uh, when do you expect this RP to finish, to complete? Um, likely we should have a final report by spring of 22. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm going to turn it back to Chair Levine for and other council members to have questions. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Cohen. And Em, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I I see we have. I'll let I'll let you cue us for questions from other colleagues, please. Yes. Uh, thanks. So thanks, Chairs Ku and Levine. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm going to now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. So first we will hear from council member Joni followed by council member Moya and then council member Barron. So council member Jonai, um, we will cue you first. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Levine and Chair Ku for this very important hearing. I have to tell you that this has been a very emotional and painful hearing for me as I'm sure it is for many of you as we talk about the remains of our deceased and loved ones and how they're handled. Um, I have so many questions and I'm sure I'm gonna have to follow up with the various agencies afterwards, but something's come to mind. Um, are we at capacity now? Do we have room now for additional burials? Can anyone answer that question? Yes, we have capacity now. Great. Um, I hear things of a bus that has to now be placed on this uh, ferry to 
go on to the island. Um, the island was in within my district. I know the island very well. Uh, I don't understand this new protocol of having to put people into a bus. And I maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on this. Sure, council member. So um, this is to support the social distancing. Um, I want to be clear that, and, and Deputy Commissioner, please correct me if I'm wrong, this is not going to be a new bus going through your district. It's no. our bus that's already on City Island. Yes. Uh, will be brought back and forth over the ferry. I'm sorry, not City Island. I apologize. Already on Hart Island. And it'll be brought back and forth over the ferry. Um, the reality is most of, I don't know if you've been on the ferry before to Hart Island, but uh, for the most part, it's outdoors, which is great for social distancing, but in inclement weather, the only space that would be available to people are those little cabins on the side of the ferry. And so we don't want, um, you know, the, the one or two days a month that people have the opportunity to go to Hart Island to be, um, to have them not be able to actually visit the island because they can't actually social distance in those little cabins. And so our solution is to put our bus on the ferry. They'll get on, on the on the Hard Island dock. This is something we've done previously. Um, so, staff I, frequently I, travel that I way, so it's not- I've personally traveled over to the island in that matter. Yeah, so it's it's not new or unheard of. It's just the, the protocol that we're going to use going forward. So I just, so this is gonna be used during inclement weather only. No, it's our. It's going to be our protocol. Am I wrong? No, I no. Mean, this is our first. Yeah. This is our first return to visitation for this month. So this is the path we've chosen for this month, and we'll continue to reevaluate <clears throat> as the reopening plans for the city and the state proceed mm -hmm. as to you know what is the best possible um, method for moving forward with visitation. But given <clears throat> the current conditions, this is what we felt was the most reasonable thing to do as our first return to visits. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna add my input here. If there's inclement weather, I could understand a bus versus a uh, confined space. If it's not inclement weather, uh, the traditional way of visiting Hearts Island, which was in an open air deck, would be the safest means. There's no reason for that extra step. You're actually confining them and, and contrary to COVID concerns, you're actually putting them in a confined space. But I'll leave that to your better judgment. I don't think that I don't think there's a need for a bus unless of inclement weather. So snow, rain, or extreme cold conditions, I could understand. Aside from that, but I think common sense would dictate there's no need for a bus. But I'll leave that to your better judgment. Um, uh, the steering committee, um, uh, Ms. Strom, that you referred to, I heard no mention of community uh, input. Uh, this uh, Hot Island is a very sensitive issue for the neighboring residents, uh, the communities that have been impacted by it. Um, I have not heard of any means by which communities can be a part of these steering committees so that their concerns can be heard, whether it be the methods of visitation or buses or um, traffic or other security concerns. So I would encourage you to please allocate space on these steering committees that will help shape a better RFP, RFP and to get ahead of it versus behind it. Um, go ahead, I'm sorry. And I know time is gonna run out and I have a lot of questions. So maybe you can answer that, uh, Ms. Strong, after I ask my next few questions. Who's making the determination now of applications that are approved for those that are seeking public burial? Um, number one. Number two, uh, I believe the, the number was 3,589 applications and only 357 were approved. Who's denying them? And on the what basis for, uh, I believe it was missing documentation or paperwork. We're talking about the most sacred of things that we can do for a loved one is a proper burial. Why are we still having 750- expired. In storage, and the word storage, when we think of deceased, is a horrible word to use. Um, why do we have these temporary uh, storage facilities as they were referred to? If there's capacity, and for those families that have already expressed the willingness to have their loved ones buried in a public burial uh, of Hart Island, why are we delaying that any longer than we have to? Um, who's made that decision? Or who will make that decision? And why is there a holdup uh, in that regard. Um, 
I have, I have so many more questions and I have, the time ran out on me. And I know that many of the people that are participating on this hearing are local residents and they have a slew of questions, but I'm really concerned on are we doing what we're, what we're accountable for as we bury our loved ones, native New Yorkers and people that choose to be buried uh, in public cemeteries such as Hart Island. Um, and so far, this has been very painful for me and I'm sure it's gonna be painful for the many more that are gonna testify. So if someone can answer those questions. Sure, council member. Thank you for the questions. And you know, we, we echo that the responsibility of laying New Yorkers to rest is a solemn one that I think all of the city agencies that are represented today take very um, take to take to heart and, and believe and we feel humbled and honored that we're able to be part of this process. Um, and we take it seriously. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I, I have three, I, I pulled out three questions from your question um, and I will answer the first one. Regarding the steering committee and the capacity study. So in 2019, we did have an open public hearing and we did have an RFI process that was open to anyone to respond, looking for questions about how the future of Heart Island should look if there are any other burial, public burial grounds that people had suggestions for, if there was different processes that we should be eliciting. We took all that information and that is what went into both the vendor, uh, the operations RFP that HRA released as well as the capacity study, which are two separate vendors that will be doing this work. So we did, um, we did solicit and receive uh, good feedback from, um, the community and we've and we've put it into it's what helped us write the um, RFP and the solicitation. Um, so to that um, effect, I believe that we have um, really taken into account not only what this means for all New Yorkers, uh, what it means was you know for City Island representatives um, and and residents. Um, and then I will let um, my colleague Natasha Gavi talk through um, some, the denial rates. Thank you, Ms. Um, I did have one question more that I, I forgot to bring up. Do, do we have an, any information on how many people applied over the course of the last year or so to visit Hearts Island? What was the number and how were they denied? What was the method of communication when um, they were able to go on a website, um, request a visitation? What was the number of visitation requests and what was the follow-up with those families trying to visit their loved ones, including those recently deceased, the 2,666 that were buried alone in the year uh, 2020? Okay, so let me, I'm, I'm writing down all your questions. I'm quarterbacking for our team. So um, uh, Natasha, if you could talk through mm -hmm. the denial rate for applications for burial systems first. Okay, so the Office of Burial Services um, receives and processes the applications uh, that office is in HRA. And um, just to clarify, the 3,589 number uh, was last reported back in January 28th of uh, 2021. And that covered the full year of 2020 and the 28 days in January of 2021. So the, the actual numbers for the year 2020 is uh, 3,549 applications received. And of that number, uh, 476 were approved. So the, the reason behind the high denial rate, the highest um, denial is based upon the applications not being completed uh, completely, meaning that the applicant has not submitted the remaining paperwork or documentation. And uh, the 2020 numbers, roughly 63% of those applications were denied because of that. And the percentage includes applicants who decided not to continue with their application for the burial allowance. Uh, we, we routinely reach out to applicants to obtain their documentation to further explain the program guidelines and how to obtain supporting documentation. Um, uh, applicants are not required to submit new applications to address missing documents. However, we find that once an applicant has a fuller understanding of the public assistance um, 
program's eligibility requirements, they often do not follow up with their application. And uh, since the income and asset eligibility criteria are set by the state, the related documentation requirements are necessary to establish eligibility for this program as it's geared towards low income, low income decedents. Ms. Gadi, thank you for that brief, for that explanation. I know it's a very complicated uh, question, and you answer the best you can. But you said sixty three percent were denied based on the application being incomplete for lack of follow up documents. Uh, aside yes. from income verification, where the family may not have that may not have access to that information. We're actually denying a family member's burial due to no fault of their own during COVID where perhaps they could not obtain this information. So the-, and, the and Sorry, I just want to interrupt, uh, Commissioner. After this, Council Member, we're going to ask that you hold your questions to uh, a second round. If that's I okay, apologize you know. in advance, Chair. Yeah, Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Natasha, is there anything you wanted to add or should I move on to the next? I, I was just going to say that the uh, eligibility criteria does include uh, getting additional documentation and that we um, routinely extend the time frame, uh, 60 days, 30 days, even if a case is closed, it can be reopened uh, upon submission of a request. Uh, and we also give a lot of time to, to get the additional documentation. We're, we're, we're flexible. Thank you so much. Um, and then Dina, if you wanted to talk through the council member's question around storage. He asked, um, you've mentioned it before, but um, how long you plan to hold the, the storage, the uh, emergency storage unit? Right, so we will continue to work with families. Uh, as soon as the family tells us that they would like uh, their loved one to be transferred to um, Heart Island for burial, we do that uh, very quickly. Or as soon as the family tells us what their final disposition um, um, decision is, then we work with them. And if it's to do a private burial, or a funding issue involved, we then work with them and HRA and other uh, nonprofits to make sure that they have access to uh, the resources that they need. Um, so there's no, no delay from the OCME on um, transferring to Heart Island once the decision is made by the family. We can, we can move very quickly on that. Great, thank you. And then finally, um, DSC, can you talk through um, the process over the last year for requests for visitation? Sure, so um, as, you know, as has been noted, visitation has been paused uh, since March of 2020. Um, in accordance, we put a notice up on our website and we also um, took down our form so that there could be no confusion so that people wouldn't be able to request a visit uh, when the visit actually couldn't happen. Um, I understand that there have been very limited number of inquiries, uh, really like one or one or two a month uh, for visitation. And if somebody did uh, inquire with us, um, they and, and they, their email was responded to and, and people were told that we did not have um, visitation currently, or if they called the Heart Island hotline, they were told the same thing. Thank you. I think that. Uh, yes, let, let, let's move on to Councilmember Barron, I believe, as right. next. Is that right? Um, Chair Levine, we actually have. Oh, forgive me, Councilmember Moya, Moya is next. Yes. Forgive so, me. Councilmember Moya. No problem. Thank you for your patience, Councilmember Moya. And you, you may begin whenever uh, the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you to um, both. Uh, uh, Chair Q and Chair Levine um, for really bringing this uh, very important uh, hearing um, uh, to light. I, I just want to, 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 to talk about uh, the burial fund that deals specifically with uh, the undocumented uh, community. Um, I uh, have the epicenter of the pandemic in Corona and in East Elmhurst area codes 11368, 11369, you know, I called for this in the very beginning, um, along with myself, 
uh, and Speaker uh, Johnson to ask why HRA would not allow undocumented immigrants to receive assistance uh, to bury their loved ones, given that we had uh, a, a large number of undocumented immigrants that were uh, dying uh, due to COVID. Um, they couldn't uh, 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 send the, the, the bodies back home to their native countries because of the COVID restrictions. Now that we injected some type of funding, at that time it was about $20 million between private and, and, and public partnerships there. Now that we're seeing that um, there's been an increase uh, for the burial assistance in the funds that are coming from the federal government. Uh, what updates uh, to the communication process has the Office of the Burial Services made uh, throughout the pandemic uh, when working with H&H &H, uh, and other hospitals to inform New Yorkers of their options and uh, assistant resources? And then I have one more question and, and that's it. Sure, thank you, Councilor Moya. Um, I'll let my colleague Natasha Godby talk through both um, the work that we're doing for the new FEMA assistance, as well as for undocumented New Yorkers. Okay, so with regard to um, communication and outreach, uh, we have updated our website and many HRA DSS promotional materials uh, over, over time. We provided FAQs, the application, and uh, additional information on our website, as well as to 311. Um, as an agency, we value our community partners and work proactively to inform and update them on our programming. Uh, the office, HRA's Office of Client Advocacy and Access, uh, is, sorry, to HRA's DSS's lead on such communication and works with our CBO partners. They send our regular communications on HRA services, including the burial program out on a weekly basis. Additionally, HRA has created training programs and outreach material that we send out to all of our sister agencies. Um, at, in the very beginning, uh, our program had worked closely with uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, wherein the IDNYC staff had worked closely with Office of Burial Services to, to um, make sure that the undocumented communities could apply for these services. So that office, Moya, continues to do the outreach uh, locally. They are engaging CBOs uh, that are going to work to continue to provide the application and the program to uh, documented communities. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So is that, uh, uh, you're saying that Moya, the other Moya, is the uh, 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 agency responsible for getting the information out uh, to the public? No, it's, it's still our Office of Burial Services, but we okay. part, partnered with Moya from the very beginning of the pandemic, and they are also continuing to outreach as well, to, to, through their CBOs as well. Um, is there uh, a I, list of those CBOs in which the, they, they are partnering up with that is made available to the public? Um, what I have here, it says, I'm sorry, I just got to find it. So the program benefited many New Yorkers. It, it looks like the CBOs identified was nice African communities together and make the road New York and Bronx works. Okay. And, and um, I'm just going to quickly, uh, I'll go back to, to, to the other questions. I just want to know, did they give input back to Moya or uh, to HRA of how many people actually came in through their CBOs uh, applying for the burial fund? Is there any uh, statistics that, that, that come in from these organizations that you just mentioned? Uh, no, not, not to my knowledge at this point in time, but we can take it back and ask. Okay, because I'd like to know how we're tracking that then, right? Because if, if they're the, the CBOs responsible for, for, for the intake in our communities, uh, how are we finding out whether or not they're having success in uh, districts like mine, which was the epicenter of this, where there's a great need for that. Uh, and how are, if we're being effective in using uh, these organizations, which I'm sure they're all uh, great organizations, but uh, I'd like to know how we can get uh, that information back because that's really important. My last question, I'm sorry, I know uh, I have a time. Uh, it, it's of the 2,334 adults estimated to have been buried in 2020. Is there an indication of those identified uh, by zip code and neighborhoods where they resided in? Uh, and in addition to the location where they, um, where they died? 
Nicole, would you like to respond? Yeah, Dina, thanks. Sorry, I wasn't sure if it should be you or DOC. Please, Dina, um, thank you. Yes, for, for uh, all uh, statistics uh, regarding uh, burials at Heart Island, demographic statistics and so forth, which it would include uh, the areas and zip codes, our uh, Department of Health is the agency that uh, manages and is in, uh, uh, all statistics are under their auspices. Um, and they also have, you know, the expertise in handling uh, confidential uh, health related information appropriately. So uh, all um, uh, demographic and statistical information regarding Heart Island uh, will be at uh, the Department of Health. And can we get, can we get those statistics? Can we get can we get the breakdown by zip code? I, I think if you would, uh, um, council member, make um, a request, uh, and, you know, as part of this, and just ask the question specifically what you want. Um, I'm sure that uh, DOH would respond appropriately. Okay, and then I just want to make sure that I get the uh, 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 CBOs that had those uh, uh, numbers of applications that came in. Thank you. Thank you both chairs and thank you to my colleagues for extending the time. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And I think council member Barron, we would like to hear from you now. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanna to thank to the chairs for having this hearing uh, and thank the panel for coming and sharing their information with us. My questions are on the same line as the, my two colleagues who posed questions before me. So there were 3,500 or so uh, persons who applied and I heard a response that some were missing information and some withdrew the request which resulted in I think how many applications being processed? So for uh, 2020, uh, sorry, 476 applications were approved. Uh, 2,949 applications were deemed ineligible. Um, 300 and, oh, sorry, 3,425 out of the 3,549 were processed. Okay. For those, okay, for those that were deemed ineligible, do we have disaggregated data as to why they were deemed ineligible? Uh, ineligible was it because they were still continuing to have missing information or was it because they withdrew the application for whatever reason? It, the, uh, the denial rate, uh, it is, it is act disaggregated by, by, um, by reason. So for those who withdrew their application, 1.7%, that, that is the, uh, the number, meaning that 50, 50 of those applications were withdrawn out of the 3,549 uh, so for those. That's a small number of people who withdrew. For those that were still deemed to be ineligible, do we have the information as to whether it was because they exceeded what the, um, what the eligibility requirement was or because they still had missing information? I'm trying to get to the point is if there are people who can benefit from having someone hold their hand and walk them through getting the information, can we get a larger number of people deemed to be eligible? Uh, yes. So the caseworkers do walk the clients through obtaining the documentation. In most instances, they're asked for the, uh, the bank statement for the decedent. Uh, if there's an insurance policy, there, that is requested. Uh, if there's any um, additional information, such as receipt of SSI benefits, a social security death benefit, uh, all of these uh, documents are asked for. And we do understand that it is um, it takes time to, to engage with another agency to get this information to be provided back to, to HRA. So the caseworkers do explain that. And we, again, we do extend the time to get this documentation uh, you know, uh, beyond the 60 days. We add another 30 days to get this information. But just so, so you know- a total of 90 days that is, is given to those who apply? Is that the cutoff, 90 yes. days? The cutoff is 60 days from the time that the letter is sent out stating exactly what needs to be submitted. Then thereafter, an extension could be requested uh, multiple times and for each extension is 30, day, 30 days. Oh, so it might extend beyond 90 days? 
Yes, yes. Okay. And, e and even if there's no engagement or communication, if we don't hear from the applicant and the case closes, they can come back and say, would you please okay. reopen my case because oh, I now have okay. the documentation. Okay, great. Now we're talking about the uh, income and eligibility of the deceased person. Correct. It's the, it's the deceased. The income and assets of the deceased person. Correct. It's the decedent, the, the decedent and the, if they have a legally responsible relative, spouse, or if they are the parent of a minor who is deceased, they too have to be low income and eligible. Okay. 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 Thank you. And now, so the next question is, um, how long do you maintain custody of the decedents until a final determination is made? Just to clarify, do you mean before they would go to Heart Island or? Yes. Yes. Do you know, do you know, would you like to walk through that process? Well, yes. So if the family has uh, not yet made a, a decision, the uh, decedent will remain with the OCE while we work with the families to make that uh, decision whether they would like the loved one to be buried at Heart Island or uh, under their final I asked that question because there was a constituent uh, that we were told received information that she had to hurry up and make her decision because if she didn't make her decision within X number of days, uh, the remains would be transported to Heart Island. And she was trying to get funds together and get the resources to be able to have a private burial. Time expired. Mr. Chair, if I could have another question, please. Is silence a um, consent agreement? <laughs> so that question is, is there a time limit? Go ahead, yeah. Hmm. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so is, is there a cutoff time by which a person must have made a decision? They're trying to get arrangements for a private. Right, so here's our, our policy or, or our process with uh, families. Our families, like I said earlier, are central and there's, uh, we try to uh, work with the family and accommodate them as uh, well as we possibly can. If a family needs to make it, there's a certain amount of time that they think about the process. And if they need more time, they just ask for more time and we give them more time. Uh, we certainly are not going to send anyone to Heart Island, a uh, loved one, if the family is saying, please hold because I, I need to make arrangements. We will just hold. Thank you. And one last question, if I may, Mr. Chair. What is the process for a family that wants to have the remains uh, disinterred and uh, interred someplace else? Uh, there is no cost uh, for the disinterment to occur uh, at, uh, at Heart Island. So the, the family would go to a funeral director, uh, say to the funeral director, I'd like to have my loved ones remain disinterred. Um, I, I believe DOC gets that request from the funeral director. The city does not charge anything for the disinterment. The funeral director then takes the remains, conducts the or whatever it is. That okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chairs, for indulging me the little extra time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council members. Thank you, council member Barron. Um, just as a final reminder, if there are any council members who are on, who um, have any questions then have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Seeing none, um, I will now turn it back to our chairs to see if they have any additional questions that they would like to ask. <coughs> Um, so uh, either Chair Ku or Chair Levine, if you have any additional questions for the administration. Um, yeah, I'm here, yeah. Yes. So my, my question is like, if the disease, um, family or list of kin doesn't want to bury the, 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 
the disease in Wuhan Island, can they use the, the money to bury it at a perfect place they choose? Um, is that question directed to me, uh, yeah. Chair? So there, yeah. is, there is no cost to a family uh, to uh, transfer their loved ones to Heart Island for burial. Um, that is completely uh, without a cost to the family. Private burials have a cost associated and that's when I would turn it over to HRA uh, for their burial office. Uh, that part would be the family would work with the, the burial office for the burial. Yes, that, that is correct. So, so what happens if the disease is undocumented? Do they, they still get the assistance? Yes. Yes, the Office of Burial Services uh, is continuing to accept applications for uh, those who are undocumented. And uh, again, as I said earlier, we worked very closely with IDNYC at the beginning of the pandemic to do outreach. And we, we still are you know, able to receive applications because the mayor's funding is still available for the undocumented applicants. Mm, okay. Uh, so I think in, in, in light of time, though, I think I finished my questions. Uh, any other members who want to, want to ask additional questions? Council Member Joe Line. Are you still there? Uh, Committee Council, I, I'm done with my questions. Is Council Member Levin there? Um, thanks, Chair Koo. Um, if you are uh, finished with your questions, it seems like we um, have wrapped up questions for the administration. Um, I'll just do one last call for, oh, I see. I was just going to do a last call for hands for other council members to raise there their hands um, since council member Ku has asked for a second round. Um, it seems as if council member Jonai, if you have additional questions, you can proceed. Time starts. Thank you. thank you. Just really quickly. Thank you, chairman Ku for allowing me to go for a second round. I'm still just disturbed by the number of denials, the 3000 that were denied uh, based on documentation or be able to uh, fill out an application. Uh, council member, uh, uh, Moya brought up a great point. It seems like the agencies that are involved in approving or disapproving these applications are first taking a position of denial. And that we have capacity. Uh, and no one in their right mind, I would imagine, that has the wherewithal, the financial resources to bury a loved one in a private cemetery would opt not to. Those 3,000 requests, I would imagine, did so because of financial hardship. They couldn't afford a private burial. And it's disturbing and heartbreaking to me to find that they were denied, which I would imagine through no fault of their own, were not <clears throat> able to get the documents that are needed. If you're asking for financial information as a loved, as a family member, I'm not privy to that. And the only people that can provide that is the IRS. IRS was shut down. They were not responding to requests for information, nor would they be willing to give that information so readily to anyone without due diligence. So it sounds like this was a more of a, let's figure out how to deny the request than actually approve their request on something so sensitive. And I'm hoping you can answer me, uh, Ms. Godby. Um, and I, I know the listeners and those that are on this hearing are shaking their heads right now saying, this is unimaginable. So um, just to clarify, so of the 2,949 uh, applications that uh, were, were ineligible, um, not in every case has it, has it been that the 
the burial has not taken place. In a lot of these situations, these are reimbursement requests, meaning that the burial has taken place and at a private cemetery. So they're asking to be reimbursed for the funding that was spent. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the reason for the ineligibility is because the program is geared towards uh, indigent decedents, indigent uh, legal, uh, legally responsible relatives. So the, the bar for the program you know, is, is quite high only because of the state's uh, guidelines that is a public assistance program. Uh, additionally, you know, now with the FEMA benefit, you know, that expands the amount of um, you know, reimbursement because th that cost is, the reimbursement there is like $9,000. And once again, you know, we are reaching out to all of the applicants, even those who were approved by HRA to receive a benefit, to, to also um, receive a letter from us encouraging them to also go and seek the, fem the FEMA benefits so that they, that they can also to get reimbursement. And my last question is, has the website been updated? Uh, providing information that beginning May visitation will begin again. Uh, please make requests. Has that been updated as of today? Yes, our website has been updated. Great. So anyone can make a request for visitation and then it's first come first serve. That's correct. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairs, for those additional questions. Thank you, Councilmember Joni. Um, so seeing no other hands raised, um, we will now conclude the administration testimony. Um, so thanks again to all members of the administration. Um, we're now gonna turn to the public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Um, for panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and so we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the entire panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you raise your hand. So now I'm going to invite the first public panel to testify. Um, we will start with Commissioner Edwina Francis Martin, followed by Amy Kaplow, followed by James D'Onofrio. Um, so Commissioner Martin, you may begin once the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Edwina Francis Martin and I am the Commissioner and Public Administrator of Richmond County. I wish to thank Chairs Levine and Ku for holding uh, the hearing today. And thank you for inviting me to testify uh, regarding the future of Heart Island and New York City's public burial process and burial assistance program. The Office of the Richmond County Public Administrator is responsible for the administration of the estates of persons that have left no will and where there are no qualified persons to administer the decedent's estate. We are a first responder city agency that serves essential public functions. Last year, we were on the front lines in helping New York City respond to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. We work closely with the Office of the New York City Medical Examiner to research unclaimed decedents to help locate family members or arrange for burial in Staten Island where that was not possible. We assisted property owners in gaining access to domiciles that were sealed due to a death occurring in the home, enabling them to retrieve items for burial, uh, wills and other essential documents, and to secure the property. We work closely with nursing homes and long-term care facilities to arrange the burials of unclaimed decedents. And as always, we protected decedents' property from waste, loss, or theft, and located persons entitled to inherit from estates. We're also a revenue generating uh, agency for the city, generating approximately 1.4 million for the city from fees uh, since 2014. In 2020, thanks in large part to member item funding from Councilwoman Debbie Rose, as well as donated services from Staten Island Funeral Homes, we arranged for the dignified burials of 64 Staten Island residents, as well as nine stillborn infants, thus preventing the fate of their being buried on Hart Island. We work closely with 
funeral directors, area hospitals, the medical examiner, as well as organizations and cemeteries that do not charge for plots, for the burial of indigent persons and stillborn infants on non-titled land. And for veteran decedents, we work with the mayor's office of veteran services to provide low or no cost burials. While caskets and some services are donated, there are many costs incurred for our burial program. We are not able to use our city budget funds for burials um, other than the member item, and we're not reimbursed for costs by the Human Resources Administration. We have a designated Friends of Organization, the Foundation for Dignity, um, that has not been able to access burial expense funding uh, for our burials in Staten Island. Um, I truly appreciate the many changes being made, uh, and I'm almost done. I see my time is almost up. The many changes that have been made through the recent legislation to the program. Um, but as um, we heard from questions today, the fact that there's still a 13% approval rate for applications, um, and uh, there's still a, a somewhat, um, I think, problematic uh, travel um, process for getting to Heart Island. Um, I think that we can all agree that burial in a home borough by cemetery professionals in a cemetery that is easily accessible is still preferable to burial on Heart Island. Staten Island has been doing this for over 30 years. Um, there are a couple of things that I just want to flag for you. Um, the FEMA um, reimbursement was mentioned. Um, and that is uh, hopefully going to be a great resource for folks. But I have heard from constituents on Staten Island um, that the cause of death, at least on Staten Island, um, is not on death certificates. Um, we reached out to our local hospital, Richmond University Medical Center, and we're told that these individuals will need to contact the Department of Health for the cause of death documentation. I see this as highly problematic and hope that the council can work with the Department of Health on a way to make this information readily and easily accessible to relatives seeking broil reimbursement um, from FEMA. And uh, the last thing that I'll mention, because I know I'm out of time, um, last year, Councilwoman Rose sponsored intro 2062-2020, which would amend the administrative code of the city of New York to allow expedited access to death certificates to the public administrators. She introduced this, legis this legislation so that staff of public administrators' offices, a city agency, would not have to wait for hours um, if they go to the records office or for months via mail for decedent death certificates, which delay the office's ability to administer estates and constitutes a terrible waste of estate wealth and of city resources. I request that the Committee on Health, um, where this legislation is, uh, hold a hearing on this legislation uh, as soon as it can. Uh, and I also um, am asking the chair of the, of the committees here today to sign on as co-sponsors of this legislation, as well as all of the committee members. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, when, when you're taking questions. <laughs> Thanks so much, Commissioner Martin. Um, I'm now going to turn to our next panelist, who's Amy Kaplow. Time starts now. Okay, my name is Amy Koplow. I'm the executive director of the Hebrew Free Burial Association. We've been in existence since 1888, providing um, indigent people of the Jewish faith um, a respectful and dignified burial. Um, our cemetery in, is in Staten Island. Um, we work um, closely with OCME. We work with the public administrators and we also work with HRA. Um, we have for many years have had the un unique um, classification with HRA as an organizational friend, which allows us to apply for the HRA um, indigent burial benefit when there's no family. Um, I, um, I thank um, the, the, this committee, the council members um, for allowing me to speak. And um, I also am uh, very heartened by um, the improvements um, that um, um, Deputy Commissioner um, Godby spoke about, but um, I, I, there, 
there's still a huge room for improvement, which I do want to um, talk about. And I also am very concerned as somebody who has worked with HRA now for 20 years um, about their ability to take on and manage a, a whole new thing, which is managing indigent burials in city cemetery, because um, um, there are really challenges just within the indigent um, burial benefit program. Um, uh, we also suffer because um, many, many of our applications are, um, are not approved. Um, it's been very difficult during COVID. Um, it was interesting that um, Ms. Godby said that um, you can email applications. Uh, we've been uh, told that um, absolutely not, even though the HRA office was basically closed, we were still told that the applications could only be faxed or submitted by mail. Um, when nobody's in an office, how, you know, how are they going to get the applications? Applications we submitted in September, we didn't get um, notice on until late February or March. Um, um, there are, um, I, I question the training of um, the, the caseworkers that uh, come in contact with the public like us. Um, the, the, the people high up, Nicole, Natasha, uh, currently we're working with a terrific guy whose name is Michael Sullivan, who's only on loan to the department. Um, they, they're, they're good, they listen, they take what you say, but they're, Tom, they're not- right. They're not the, can I just finish? They're not the people you deal with on a, on a daily basis who in many cases uh, don't really seem um, to, to know what's going on, especially when you're asked as um, documentation to submit for a household composition for somebody who died in a nursing home and you end up getting your um, application denied because that documentation doesn't exist. Um, so, um, if my time is up, my time is up, um, but, um, it's, it, it is still problematic. Thank I'm you. I'm happy to answer questions, um, based on our experience. Thank you. Um, so we will now turn to James D'Onofrio. Time starts now. Um, and I own Grandma's Rub a funeral home. I do what HRA, uh, my clients do, and it's nothing more than a nightmare. Mr. Donofrio, you're hardly uh, audible. How about now? Better. Better? Okay. I deal with it, my clients deal with HRA, and it's a living nightmare. People bring applications, they hand deliver them. They don't get them. They're certified mail. They don't get them. I don't know how they're going to take over City Cemetery because they have a big enough problem dealing with what's going on. And if you don't believe me, any council member, just pick up the phone and call your local funeral director, funeral home, and ask them the problems that they have with HRA. It's impossible to deal with them. The families are frustrated. It's just something that should not happen. Like, I've been to city cemetery numerous times, removing people. It's really done so professional. And we in New York City, we should take pride in how we took this pandemic because we handled it, the medical examiner, everyone. We did a great job. I had to deal with outside municipalities, California. They were really lost. So if you think we didn't handle this pandemic properly, you know, the direction of Frank Powell and the medical examiner and the temporary storage, I think the city did a great job. Um, human resources, I sent the family there on a Friday at three o'clock. And on Monday, they moved. They didn't tell anyone. 
And when I finally got to speak to the director, Mr. Dix, they said, it's in New York. We don't have to notify anyone. So that cavalier attitude that they have, I don't think it's going to cut it with um, City Cemetery. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I will now turn to the chairs to see if they have any questions for our first panel. Okay. So um, thanks again for your for your testimony. Um, seeing no questions and no hands raised from from other council members, we will now turn to our second and a final public panel for this hearing. Um, so the final panel will be Melinda Hunt, Kathy Chebeck, Barbara Byrne Delensic, Teresa Kurtz, and Stuart Sorrell. Um, so we will now turn to- If you, if you oh. don't mind, Em, j just a very brief comment on okay. that very impactful panel before we'll give a moment for our next panel to queue up. But uh, I want to thank everyone who just testified for pointing out very clear discrepancies between uh, what should be the bureaucratic procedures and what real New Yorkers are experiencing. And um, we're going we're gonna to demand clarification on this, on the administration. I understand our format doesn't allow um, for uh, the administration to respond, but know that uh, we hear you that we care about these inconsistencies um, and that we're gonna pursue answers to the points that you raise. Um, and Commissioner uh, Francis, it's always great to see you. And so in particular, I know you have a number of important points. Uh, um, everything you said is going to be recorded and transcribed and we'll, we'll pursue follow-up. Just wanted to make that comment. Thank you again to our previous panel and I look forward to hearing the next panel. Thank you, Chair. So we will now turn to the next public panel. Um, so again, we will be starting with Melinda Hunt. Um, so Melinda Hunt, you may begin once the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Melinda Hunt. I'm founder of the Heart Island Project. Our mission is to provide assistance to families and friends of the buried on Heart Island. We host a free online database and plot locations for burials starting with in 1980. We advocate for transparency and preservation of the historic natural burial process, process and preservation of the natural burial process on Heart Island, as well as designating City Cemetery a national monument. I wish to testify about the importance of Heart Island to the people of New York, especially during this pandemic. This burial process has served New York City for many epidemics, providing a safe and comforting experience to low-income people of color who are disproportionately buried on Heart Island uh, should be a priority. Uh, and I have I created a few, just a list of things that I think would be positive steps forward. Uh, I'm delighted to hear that the mayor has appropriated funding to remove the buildings. I recommend that they be removed quickly. Uh, the buildings are scary to people who visit. Uh, they're a reminder of Heart Island being managed by the penal system for a very long time. Uh, I think the city should develop a master plan for restoring the landscape with native plants and engage the public in learning how natural burials support the ecosystem. I disagree with what many members of the city council have said about disparaging the burials on Hart Island. I haven't heard any uh, complaints about how the medical examiner has, ha has worked with families. They've given families a lot of time and support. And I don't think members of the city council uh, should be uh, shaming people who have agreed to a city burial. I, I really think that's wrong. Uh, I think that the city should develop a public relations strategy for encouraging people to choose natural burials as a way to preserve green space in New York City and beyond. 
uh, Heart Island uh, should be included as part of planning for climate change. And I think members of the city council, you should show that you care about low income New Yorkers by visiting the graves of their friends and family and inviting them to be part of turning Heart Island into a national park that honors their contributions to building our city and our country. Mother's Day is this Sunday. Heart Island is a beautiful and sacred place that should be open on Mother's Day every year. Let's celebrate the end of this pandemic by planting a landscape of tomorrow to honor the lives lost to COVID. Thank you for permitting me to speak today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now turn to Kathy Chebec for their testimony. Um, Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I came to this hearing to speak about the future of Hard Island. Um, I'm a resident of City Island, a member of our local civic association. And as far as the burial process, as a New Yorker, to what I just listened to, I would think it would be difficult for the public in their grief to manage their way through every alphabet agency there is. But that's not what I came to speak about, but I would think it would be difficult. Um, I, I wanted to refer to the capital money to clean up the island, demolish the buildings. I'm not sure if you're aware, I submitted last time a uh, from New York sanitation report of an inspection back in the eighties that uh, there were gallons of lead paint. There were drums uh, containing PCBs, asbestos scattered throughout the building, large asbestos covered pipes running above the ground on the east end of the island. And this is a report from that and it should be I'll mail a copy to M. Balkin, who was very nice and helped out. But I'm speaking for our community. I, I, I feel our community has been ignored. The last two um, hearings we had, we live in City Island. I think uh, Heart Island should remain respectful and dignified for the people that that are buried there. There are many City Islanders that do have relatives that are buried there. Um, as does New York City. To become a national park or any type of destination location other than respectful remembrance of the dead, personally, I would find appalling. Our community is very small. The only way to reach that island right now is through a residential street where there's no parking to get on uh, a bus or a ferry to go to Hart Island. Um, the ACLU, even in their statement and testimony stated that that area is not conducive to major travel. We live on an island, one way on, one way off. We have 20,000 visitors every weekend here. We have no municipal services in the past year, not much traffic agents, police. Um, I don't see anything beyond that 50 million is just to uh, demolish buildings. Uh, we're concerned about our health, any of those things making their way through our community. And we just, how are we going to fit access to a public park on an island one way in, one way out, without a voice? Our councilman's voice was not heard in this hearing. The hearing before a former councilman has expressed the concerns of our community. And I feel the city council has not reached out to our community. And even in your committee report does not mention our community. And our councilman is a hardworking councilman who advocates for our community and you are not listening to his district. And thank you. I think that's it. If anyone has any questions about our community and the access to it, I've been to Hart Island many more times than probably anyone on this panel. Haven't lived here for decades, been on that island during the 60s, the 70s, and I'm again. Sorry. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Uh, thank you. We're now going to turn to our next panelist, who's Barbara Byrne Delensic. Um, so you may begin once the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I, too, have been a resident of City Island for many years, for over 45 years and as an officer of both the City Island Civic Association and the City Island Historical Society, um, I would like to speak out on two aspects of the burial capacity study proposed by the HRA for Hard Island. As noted in the study, 
The only access to Heart Island is by ferry from City Island. That's the only mention of City Island. Uh, since access to Heart Island should also be made part of this study since it is where bodies are conveyed to Heart Island as well as visitation in the future, which is expected to increase. There was to have been such a study held by the Department of Transportation during the last two years, but to my knowledge, this was never carried out, or at least the community which had asked and Councilman Joe and I had also asked that we be made part of it. Uh, we've never heard from anybody about it. Now that New York City has a viable ferry system, Hart Island should be considered as a destination for visitors traveling by ferry from other parts of the city, rather than using City Island as the only access point. More important, however, um, although not discussed at all by anyone today, is the issue of cremation. And I believe I speak for virtually all City Island residents and businesses when I say that the very idea of putting a crematorium on Hart Island will meet with virtually unanimous opposition. The Environmental Protection Agency does not regulate the emissions produced by crematoria, although it has been documented that such emissions can contain mercury and other hazardous substances, and there are no other federal rules or regulations regarding crematoria. I believe it would be a waste of both time and money to study the potential for a crematorium on Hart Island as there is currently no power on the island to run such a facility and the negative response from neighboring communities, including City Island, would be considerable. The very fact that the Human Resources Administration would consider placing a crematorium next to the largest public park in New York City, let alone City Island with its 4,500 inhabitants, indicates a lack of understanding of a negative response that such a proposal would face and a waste of funding to study the issue. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now turn to C Teresa Kurtz. Um, you may begin once the Sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I just wanna say that as someone who has been a resident on City Island for most of my life, I do have a relative buried there. Um, I do appreciate that now we can go there. However, I really, I'm concerned that making it a national park or a public park will affect the dignity and respect that the people buried there deserve. And everything else I feel was already um, addressed by Kathy Seebeck. So I will leave it at that. Thank you for listening to me. Um, thank you. So um, I will now turn it to any council members who may have questions. As a reminder, you can use the Zoom raise hand function to answer any questions that, or to ask any questions you may have of this panel. All right, so seeing none. Um, and if I may, very briefly, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, I wanna thank this panel. Uh, first, just a word about Melinda Hunt who has done so much over the years to bring openness and transparency and ac access and dignity to Heart Island and uh, really grateful for your, your leadership on this issue. Uh, you, you have done so much to bring this to the public's attention um, and that's just so important. And to, to our friends at City Island, I do wanna allay some of the concerns. I, I know of no serious plan to do cremation on the island. Uh, there are a variety of, of, object, of objections even beyond those that you voice. So I, I don't think that has to be taken as a, as a serious uh, proposal. And uh, you know, as for the vision of the island as, 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 a, as, as a park, uh, th this is an isolated place. And uh, I think under any scenario, uh, it would be uh, more limited access uh, and, and a more dignified place than uh, your typical public park. Uh, this is not going to be a place for hot dog vendors and other such uh, stuff. This is going to be the kind of place that um, people can come to to pay uh, re homage and reverence to those who are buried there, um, to to soak in the, the stunning natural beauty, to learn about the incredible history of a century and a half of a half more than a century and a half 
um, on the island. And um, we have heard uh, over the years, real concerns from residents of City Island about um, what greater access would mean uh, for, for City Island. And, and, you know, there are also multiple other uh, points of departure uh, in the Bronx and in Queens that, that might ultimately be preferable. I think that, that question remains open. So um, I, I hope that residents of City Island approach this uh, with open minds and with the sense of the great possibilities uh, that this island offers. Um, that's it for me on a comment on this panel. And Em, are we, are we ready to wrap up at this point? Uh, yes, I was just going to see if we had inadvertently missed anyone who uh, may have registered to testify today, who has not yet been called. Um, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. All right, so now we are officially uh, ready to wrap up uh, Chair Levine. Um, well, I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll cue Chair Ku. Uh, Chair Ku, would you like to make any final remarks? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair Levine. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists uh, who come to testify. Uh, and I heard all your suggestions. And in this council, our council members will do our utmost uh, to solve the problems. Or, uh, on on the residents of City Island, no, uh, and no, death is a very touchy subject. No, nobody want to talk about death. You know, we, we all welcome birth. You know? So, but we all have to pass. So I think we have to give these people identify uh, respect, respectful, respectable way of uh, uh, burial and let their families uh, have accessible and, and, and a way to visit their disease. You know, this is the minimum we can do. Uh, so I respect all your comments and suggestions and our council members and our speaker will try to do, um, do the utmost to help uh, all of you. Thank you. And I'll just add, first off, Chair, gratitude for your leadership uh, on parks in general. Uh, and on this topic today, we're, we're, we're really lucky to have you chairing the Parks Committee. So thank you for your leadership, Chair Ku. And, thank you. And uh, I want to thank everyone who spoke today from the public. And I just want to reiterate um, my belief that we have an opportunity now to do something uh, incredibly meaningful for Heart Island so that it really is a place that offers a dignified final resting place for uh, our loved ones who have been buried there and who continue to be buried there. Victims of infectious disease, victims of neglect, people who have been isolated and impoverished in life. And we do wanna be able to uplift them uh, in their final resting place. So uh, thank you all so much. Uh, that's it from me. and. Uh, Unless there's any other business, Sam, uh, this will conclude our hearing. I also want to thank the committee staff, you know, for doing a, a wonderful job and holding, putting everything together, and uh, and also want to thank everyone taking the time uh, to testify today. You know, the pandemic has uh, understandable highlighted many of uh, the existing issues and concerns regarding Heart Island especially in terms of access to the island to visit the loved ones. We have just under two months before the island is formally transferred to uh, past department. And we hope that uh, agencies who testify today uh, will have, uh, to, who testify today, uh, take what we have heard from our panels into consideration and work to find the best way uh, to serve New Yorkers. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Koo, and this will conclude our hearing. Thank you so much, everybody.